is lecture 11 in our survey of the artifacts in the British Library and the British Museum, which are connected with the Bible. Uh, in this lecture, we particularly want to look at the artifacts connected with the Persian Empire, which eventually will end with the invasion of Alexander the Great of the Greeks. But most of this lecture will be about the Persians. In slide 187 and 188, you will see uh, a rather large reconstruction of what was called the Balawat Gates. Now, in uh, reality, these uh, wooden gates, which you see in the British Museum, which are, are quite large, uh, extending almost all the way to the ceiling, uh, these gates are not the original gates. These are a reconstructed set of gates, which are based upon the remnants that are found. If you look in the glass cases to the side of this gate, you will see the original implements that were discovered at Balawat. And even though these gates are not Persian, they are Assyrian, they do help us to understand something that happened in the Persian period. When the people of Israel came back to Jerusalem from Babylon in uh, the uh, return from the exile, uh, one of the things that they discovered was, of course, that they had to rebuild the city, which had been uh, demolished by the Babylonians. Uh, when Nehemiah came on the scene, he discovered that the gates had been burned with fire. And the reason that is so is because gates typically were made of wood, uh, gates made out of heavier materials like stone or, or metal would have been very uh, awkward and almost uh, impossible to manage. But gates out of wood uh, were uh, lighter in weight, and of course uh, that meant that they were more usable. Uh, this uh, depiction of gates would probably have been similar to the kinds of gates that were rebuilt for the city of Jerusalem in the time of Nehemiah. We don't know exactly, of course, but this is one of the uh, most uh, ancient representation of gates that we have uh, from antiquity. In slide 189 and 190, you have uh, a little artifact that depicts a Persian horseman. You'll see the distinctive headgear and the horseman. And the Persians used horsemen extensively, both as a cavalry unit and also as dispatches, which traveled uh, all the way to the western side of the empire uh, to carry dispatches and communication between the outlying provinces and the Persian center of government. You may remember, if you have read the book of Nehemiah, that when Nehemiah came to Jerusalem, he came with a detachment of Persian cavalry and uh, himself uh, rode a horse. And when he made his night inspection of the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down, he rode a horse uh, around the southern tip of the city of David. In fact, at one point, the terrain became so steep uh, and the, and the uh, fragments of the wall so broken that he was forced to dismount from his horse and to proceed on foot. But at least this reminds us of the fact that Nehemiah himself was a horseman. Slides 191 and 192 uh, show a marvelous uh, Persian riton. This is a silver vessel, fluted vessel of hammered silver, uh, very exquisitely done. And they remind us that Nehemiah was himself a cupbearer to the emperor of Persia. Now, a cupbearer uh, is a very important person because he's very close to the emperor. Because emperors were very closely guarded, it was very difficult for an enemy of the emperor to uh, attempt an assassination. And so one of the things that was uh, more likely is that rather than the emperor being assassinated, because he was, of course, heavily guarded, is that he would be poisoned. And so um, the cupbearer to the king always tasted his food, tasted uh, whatever drinks he had in order to protect him. So if the cupbearer uh, dis uh, detected any poison or had any ill effects, then of course the emperor would not eat that particular thing. Uh, in any case, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to Artaxerxes, the emperor of Persia. And this riton is the type of thing in which he would have served the king. In slide 193 and 194, you see also a drinking bowl, which is made of silver. This particular one uh, excavated uh, from the palace of Artaxerxes I, which, of course, is the palace of Nehemiah's emperor. It's not 
impossible that uh, Nehemiah may actually have served Artaxerxes in this very uh, drinking dish. Uh, we don't really know that for sure. Uh, there's certainly no signatures. Uh, and that may be a stretch. Uh, it's kind of an imaginative idea that's uh, uh, exciting but uh, unverifiable. But n- nonetheless, it would be this type of thing that Nehemiah would have used as he served the emperor. And then in slides 9, 195 and 196, you see yet another rite on this one uh, made out of silver, but the uh, animal depiction uh, is in gold. Uh, so a very beautiful goblet. And this may also remind you of something from the Bible, because Esther, in the book of Esther, when she was uh, in uh, a banquet with Xerxes, her husband, they drank from what is called goblets of gold, or golden goblets, very much like this one. Now, this one may not have been the one that Esther used. Uh, We have no reason to think that it was, but it certainly would have been the type of thing that Esther would have used. In fact, according to Herodotus, uh, which is uh, a Greek historian, the Persians uh, uh, did a ceremony of drinking over all of their major decisions, both before the decision and after the decision was reached. And these kind of goblets would have been used in that kind of decision-making ritual. Slide 197 shows a large casting. This casting uh, was made uh, in Persepolis, and it is from the palace of Xerxes I, and is uh, of Xerxes I, who was the husband of Esther. Now, in the Bible, uh, Esther's husband is called Ahasuerus, and for a long time we didn't know for sure uh, which of the Persian empires this was related to, but eventually uh, in uh, text from the Persian emperor, Empire, uh, we discovered that Ahasuerus was Xerxes I. If you look at slide 198, you will see a close-up of the figure of Xerxes, which is from this larger casting. Uh, You'll notice that he is sitting on a throne. His feet are on a footstool, which uh, reminds you of uh, Psalm uh, 110, which says, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. In his uh, left hand, Uh, I'm sorry, his right hand, uh, he is holding the royal staff, and in his left hand, he is holding a lotus, which is the symbol of royalty. His folded garments uh, are similar to the garments that would have been worn by Mordecai in the book of Esther, because Mordecai was privileged and honored to wear a robe that the king himself had worn. You'll also notice that his face is disfigured. Uh, This may have been done by the Greeks after they conquered the Persians, certainly probably done by some enemy of the emperor, and the disfigurement of the face and the uh, fleshy parts uh, of depiction are fairly typical of ancient bas-reliefs. When enemies would, would conquer or would invade, they would deface the images of the emperor. Slide 200 shows a horse with a royal crest. You'll notice just uh, at the bottom of the neck of the horse there is a royal crest. This uh, may remind you again of one of the honors that was bestowed upon Mordecai. Mordecai had discovered a plot against the life of Xerxes I, and in the book of Esther this plot had been recorded in the day book of uh, the emperor. Uh, One evening when he was having difficulty sleeping, he was reading the day book and discovered that Mordecai had saved his life by warning him of this plot. And so as part of the honors that he'd bestowed upon Mordecai, Mordecai was privileged to ride in the chariot of the emperor and to ride behind a horse which had the royal crest. And this is the royal crest. In slides 202 and 203, you find a glazed brick depiction of a guardsman, this one from the palace in Susa, one of the uh, major administrative centers of the Persian Empire. You'll find similar uh, glazed brick reliefs of Persians in the Louvre in Paris, if you you should ever visit that museum. This one in the British Museum is quite large uh, and quite colorful, although probably the colors have somewhat faded uh, over the centuries. But this one was excavated from the palace of Darius I, uh, which is the, the Persian emperor who allowed the Jews to resume building their temple. If you recall from the book of Ezra, the Jews had built their, had begun building their temple, but then the building project had been suspended for about 16 years. 
Uh, after that 16-year period, they were motivated by the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to begin rebuilding again. And in the process, they had to once again search the archives for the permit for the building. And they did this during the reign of Darius I. Uh, Darius I began reigning in 522 B.C., and the Bible says that the, the the building project of the temple resumed in the second year of Darius, making that 520 B.C. Slide 204 and 205 show Persian uh, a Persian chariot and four horses. This is a small model, but very exquisitely uh, done, and it is in gold. And it does remind you of the vision in Zechariah chapter 6, in which Zechariah saw chariots, uh, four Persian chariots actually, traveling in four directions, north, south, east, and west, which symbolized the uh, dispatches and chariots of God himself. But he used this, uh, uh, this motif uh, in the vision. And so this gives you an idea of what those chariots may have looked like. And then finally, in slide 206 and 207, we see the bust of Alexander the Great. Alexander, who was a student of, uh, of Aristotle, uh, became the conqueror of the Persian Empire. Uh, he worked his way uh, eastward. Uh, he fought the Persians, uh, uh, then later uh, went to Egypt and uh, uh, conquered Egypt, then came back and fought the Persians again. But by about 331 BC, Alexander was heir to the Persian Empire. And the Greek Empire, which now followed, would continue until the time of the Romans. During the uh, Greek part of the empire, you should remember that Alexander's ideal that the world should speak Greek and adopt Greek culture was implemented. And so following Alexander's death, his successors continued with that basic ideal. And so throughout the ancient world, Greek became the standard language of the day in many parts of the world so that most people were bilingual. They spoke their native dialect, but they also spoke Greek. And of course, that's why when you get to the New Testament, that even in the land of Israel, in Galilee and Jerusalem, people speak Greek as well as their native Aramaic. And this is the end of Lecture 11.